springtime, flowers, didn't even look. Um, we're glad you're here with us today. Um, hope that everyone comes away blessed. Uh, there will be no five o'clock Bible study in the BLC this afternoon. Um, there is also no live stream. Um, I don't know what the technical issue is there. It is being recorded and will be available on YouTube after. Um, and also after church, we would like the board members to stay after for a few minutes. Um, we'll meet in the chapel. Um, and other than that, it's whatever is in the bulletin. Um, we're very glad you're here with us today. Oh, and Melanie has something she would like to say. Good morning, church family. Just bringing to your attention once again the Mind Fit program that we have that we're hosting April 11 to 14. In your bulletin today, you'll see a different kind of a card than what's been in there the last couple of weeks. And this really is an invitation for you to start praying about who you'd like to invite to come. Um, I'll let you go ahead and read through that. This would be a blessing for our church, but it'd be even more of a blessing for people in our community. So I'd really like to encourage you to invite people to come. This will be very well done um, based on the Bible and on research. And people will leave blessed because they came with some, some good tools in their back pocket. If you missed it, the MindFit table is right out in the lobby with a large QR code on the front for you to, to get, your, get your camera out. Remember we went through that last week of how to register via the QR code. It's on the large banner. And also there's a lot of materials out there for you to take and share. It's sharing materials, invites. There's some door hangers, there's some regular flyers, and there's some glow tracks. So I hope when you leave today that you'll scoot right by there and grab some of those because it's going to take all of us to get this spread out into our community. We have one video, a little short video to show you again today. Thank you. Hey, Alex Rodriguez here, associate speaker at the Voice of Prophecy. Just wanted to take a couple of minutes to thank you again for partnering with us and to invite you to pray and invite others to attend the MindFit event. Here's the reality. There's eight billion people in the world, and we are told that one in eight are struggling with mental illness. That's a staggering one billion people. And in the USA, the numbers are worse, one in five. That means that we're all touched in one way or another by mental illness. This is your next door neighbor, work colleague, high school friend, family member, or maybe even you. Through MindFit, you have an opportunity to make a real difference in people's lives. And how better to invite people to your church than to bring them to an event that is completely non-threatening and meets the real needs of the struggles they are facing each and every day. Here's what I want you to do. Take your MindFit prayer card and ask God to tell you who to write down on the list. Then write the names of at least five people you think would benefit from attending this program. Each day, pray diligently for the people on your list, asking God to give you an opportunity to invite them. Then, with the courage that God will give you, take them an invitation and personally hand it to them. Statistics reveal that the most effective marketing plan is through personal invitation. I'm looking forward to hearing the stories of how God blessed you and your church through your faithful prayer and diligence. Know that we are praying for you, your community, and the MindFit event. morning. Happy Sabbath. I'm so grateful to see the sun. Oh, it's such a beautiful day. Um, please join us in singing. Uh, the first song we're going to be singing is Jesus is Coming Again, page 213. As you turn to 213, I just want you to realize how lucky you are. This is the only church I've ever been to that has their own little orchestra. Isn't that so cool? Um, and they also play at 930 in the morning. I don't know if, if you've ever been here at 930 but they play here at 9.30 as well. 
so you can get in the spirit. to 334, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, and we're going to read all three stanzas. Doxology, please stand.
Please bow your heads for prayer. Most loving and precious Father in heaven, what a blessing it is to be in your house. Praise and glory to you. Thank you so much for the sunshine on this Sabbath day. It's so wonderful to be in your house, dear Lord, and give you praise. I pray for the Holy Spirit to be with us today and throughout the day, that you will enlighten our hearts for what you have for us. As a special blessing on our speaker today, that you will enlighten our hearts for the message you have for us. All glory and praise to you, dear Lord. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Bless the Sabbath, everyone. The offering that will be taken today is for the local budget. Over the course of 52 Sabbaths through the year, 27 of those Sabbaths are set aside for the local budget. And of course, we all know that the offering is much more than lights and water for our church. It covers a broad spectrum of things that allows us to witness to our community. It includes evangelism, music uh, departments, our live streaming, a plethora of things that we need to cover for the expenses of this church. And as you can see in the bulletin, we have improved over the last few months, but we're still kind of behind. So if you look in the page there where it says Cheerful Givers Report, you can see uh, what's going on there. Also, I'd like to point out today the generosity of the commitments in contribution that this church makes regularly. Did you know that 85% of the amount we expect we need for the front entrance has come in? 25% of the digital sign that will truly make us a light on the hill has come in? And 89% of the amount the pathfinders are attempting to raise to go on this wonderful trip of a lifetime to an international camporee. Did you know that's almost 60% of the monies that we have set out to raise, separate from the other giving that we do? I think that deserves an amen. amen. Faithful contributions and commitments for the labor of love of this church is a matter of heart. We give because we have already received God's love and blessings. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the abundance of your love and your blessings. We thank you for the anointing of this church and the ministry of service it has to our community. Use us today and tomorrow to touch and encourage the lives around us. May all that we do bring glory to your kingdom. In our dear Savior's name I pray. Amen. The deacons will wait on us.
Thank you, Janet. Everyone needs to sit up on the platform at least once to listen to that piano. Um, it's time for the children's story. I'm really looking forward to this. Jeremiah has a story for you. If the children would come forward. Is it on? Oh, yeah. I'm not Jeremiah. But kids, come on up here. Jeremiah did not chicken out. He is still going to do it. Come on up. Yes. Way to go, older kids. Come on up. It's with such great happiness that I introduced this 10-year-old kid of mine to do children's story for the children, right? Let's have prayer first. Father God in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath and thank you for these children. Bless them, Lord. Amen. I'm going to be the mic holder. I do play a part in this. Today I'm going to be reading a story called Part of a Colony. For, in fact, the body is not one member, but many. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. Ants are the most numerous creatures on earth. Their combined weight is greater than the combined weight of all humans on the planet and makes up one-tenth of the world's total animal tissue. Strong in relation to their size, ants can carry 10 to 20 times their body weight and work in teams to move extremely heavy things. If a man could run as fast for his size as an ant can, he could run the speed of a racehorse. These little creatures have the largest brain among insects in proportion to their size. Their little mushroom-shaped brains have about 250,000 brain cells, which function similar to the gray matter of human brains. A human brain has 10 billion brain cells, so in theory, a, colon, a colony of 40,000 ants has collectively, collectively the same size brain as a human. How does it feel to, to know you are as smart as a hill of ants? Extremely social, ants also share these activities with humans. Livestock farming, herding aphids like sheep and milking them for nectar-like food. Cultivation, growing and storing underground gardens for food. Child care, tenderly feeding their young and providing intensive nursery care all the while man maintaining careful climate control of 77 degrees Fahrenheit for developing ants. Education, teaching younger ants the tricks of the trade. Civic duties, working together and organizing massive group projects. Military forces, raising an army of specialized soldier ants to ward off other insects, animals, and any attacking enemies. Earth moving moving little mountains every day. Engineering, tunneling from two directions and meeting exactly midway. Flood control, incorporating water traps to keep out rain. Communications, have a complex tactile and chemical communication system. Career specialization, learning new careers like cleaning, foraging, caring for the young, or guarding. But as intelligent and resourceful as they are, Ants cannot survive alone. They can only exist and thrive as part of a colony. Likewise, the Bible teaches that Christians will only thrive as part of a church family. It is God's plan that we should care for one another. So just like ants, we can all be part of a church family working together for one purpose of serving God and bringing others to Jesus. Amen. All right? Let's have prayer. Does any, any of you guys want to have prayer? Perfect here. You can have. Oh, you didn't volunteer? Okay, that's fine. I'll have prayer. Father God, thank you for the sunshine and thank you for the sun um, and the sun that got sent here to earth to die for us. And Lord, we want to be part of the bigger family, the family of God. Thank you. Amen.
Our special highlighted uh, scripture today is found in the book of James, chapter 5, verse 11. And this is a time where I think that we all have a chance to be a part of our worship service. If we want to look in, follow along in this text, there are, if you don't have a Bible, it's over in your Bible. James is toward the end of the, after Hebrews, toward the end of the Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, there are some in the uh, rack in front of you there. And I noticed in looking at them that there's two different pages. On some of them, it's 1161, and on some of them, it's 1204. So depending on that, you might have a little trouble finding them there in the Bible or in the pew Bible or the Bible in front of you there. But I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version, and obviously... Uh, if you have a different version, you compare there. But I think we'll be blessed by reading the Word of God. And this section is called, Be Patient and Persevering. James 5, verse 11. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Amen. And we're blessed by the... I believe we're blessed by the reading of the word and what the message that God has for us here. Amen. Will those that are able please kneel for prayer with me? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day that you've given us and that we can come and worship together, that we can be encouragement to each other, uh, be with us uh, in this service, that we'll gain the blessings that you would have us to gain, and be with Will and his message that he'll speak to our hearts. Be with those that um, can't worship with us today, um, be with them, bless them in their lives. Be with the leaders of our church, um, especially the leaders of our conference. Help them in their uh, work that, that they'll follow your, your guidance and your will. Um, be with those of our congregation that are sick and in need of healing, be with them, heal them, um, give them courage and comfort. Those that are, are ministering to them, give them courage and strength. Be with uh, the young people of our church, guide them, uh, give them a desire to seek and study and to know you better. Uh, be with those that are suffering the loss of loved ones, Give them comfort. Be with us as we deal with this community that will be a light to this community and that, that uh, they'll see you reflected in us. Be with us today um, in our lives. Forgive us of our sins and shortcomings and help us that we'll surrender our lives and our will to you, that we'll be ready to go home to heaven with you when you come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
what delightful and exquisite music our young people brought to us today. How many of you are ready to have them do a concert? <laughs> Let's bow our heads for prayer. Eternal God, we live under your mercy. I cannot speak this message without the blood of Christ washing my, my life. And so I come and I give this message to you and ask for the Holy Spirit of God to be with us, to enlighten us, so that we may look upon Jesus, our all-sufficient Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. They say confession is good for the soul. And I must confess that I fell into this book and was in this book for about four months, completely lost in it. It's an amazing book, and it had some resonance with me. Because I, like you, I have experienced suffering in my life. I still experience suffering. My friend Daniel was a head elder. He was a Sabbath school teacher. He was a preacher. He took care of the congregation. We used to run together and prepare for marathons. We climbed Mount Adams, Mount St. Helens. We had a lot of fun. We made fun of each other, all in good taste, of course. Back then, way back then, uh, we used to run 5, 7, 10, 15, 20 miles. One weekend I couldn't go, so Daniel and his wife came over for Sabbath lunch. That Sunday he went out, he was an arborist, and before he went out he ran with the guys for 11 miles. I couldn't go because I was deep in my master's degree uh, studies. That same day, he went out to bid on a, on a job, and there was thunder and lightning all around. So they went inside the house and came back out to continue the bid. Unfortunately, out of nowhere, tragedy struck. Lightning came from the earth and went through his body. He laid in a coma for two weeks at Legacy Hospital. And then he was gone. The question of why was loud all those days, even today. His son left the church for a time. But God is a gracious and merciful God, and I want to tell you that he has come back to the church. In this book, there is a loud why, a why with no answers, except for the first two chapters of the book. Yet they never knew. They never got the answers. Yet we know. I want to invite you to experience the grandeur the magnificence, the awesomeness of this book. It can only be experienced if you linger long in the story of Job. But let me warn you, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant, a waterfall, yet maybe Niagara Falls. It's about suffering and it's about the great controversy. Some things to know. Job in Hebrew means persecuted or hated. The inspired pen says Moses wrote the book in the Midian Desert. This book is to be read by God's people until the end of time. Job was a priest who labored for the salvation of others. More to know. The inspired pen says, and I want you to really pay attention to what this says. Good and evil come up on all. Sometimes people go beyond the boundary of God's protection and grace, and Satan exercises power to harm, and God does not intervene. 
Many think that suffering and calamity is a sign of enormous sin. God allowed Satan to be afflicted. God allowed Satan to afflict Job, even though Job was a righteous man. What do we know about Job? He was called the greatest man in the East. What did God say about him? I'd like to invite you to turn over to Job 1. Job 1 chapter 1 says this is the greatness of Job he was the greatest man in the east there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job and that man was blameless and upright one who feared God and shunned evil I like what the English Standard Version says turns away from evil I don't know about you but I have a hard time always following Jesus and this is a good example of what our example needs to be the answer at the beginning of the book and yet there's still questions what do we know about Job the answer in the beginning of the book at the end of the book there's more questions than answers you know Paul asked for some answers Many theologians believe that Paul had a problem with eyesight. And in 2 Corinthians 12, God told him, My grace is sufficient. That eyesight issue never went away. Peter, one time after he was returned from betraying Jesus, they were on the beach, and Peter and Jesus were walking on the beach, and here's John behind them coming forward and Peter asked about what about this man what about John and Jesus answered what is that to you follow me C.S. Lewis and Mer Christianity says there are questions which I do not think we have been told the answer there are some questions to which I may never know the answer it may be all answered with one great question. Like what Jesus told Peter. What is that to you? Follow me. You see behind the curtain, we see the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Satan has two charges against God and against the integrity of Job. We look at these charges here. You know, there, there was a day that the sons of God came before God. And I don't understand any of that. Apparently, Satan came and represented our world. And there is a charge that he started with. You know, God points out the integrity of Job. And in and verses 9 on Satan answered the Lord and he said, Does God, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not met his, him an edge, a hedge around him in his household, around all that he has? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have been increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all he has and he will surely curse you to your face. That was the first charge. And then the second charge was found in Job 2, verses 4 through 9. Once again, after all that happened to Job, and we'll look into it, once again Satan answers God. Skin for skin in verse 4. All that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. After the losses, after the loss of his health, Job could only cling to God. C.S. Lewis, in uh, his book, a personal journey, a grief observed, was published 
after the death of his wife, Helen. You see, after four years of marriage, Helen suffered a painful death after a battle with cancer. It's a wrenching, raw, and honest look at wrestling to understand the death of his wife. And he said, why is God so present in our times of prosperity and so very absent in the time of trouble? But then God reminded, he continued, at the same time, this is the same thing that happened to Christ on the cross. Because Christ said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, God was there at the cross. The darkness that surrounded the cross shielded the very presence of God with His Son. He was there, and He's there with you every time you have days where you suffer. There is a story of a man that sees footprints in the sand. You see, those footprints are the very footprints of God when He has carried you in your days of suffering. But it says here in the verse, verse 6, spare His life. Matthew Henry's commentary says the following, if God did not chain up the roaring lion, how soon would we, would we be devoured? You see, in the life of Job, there are several things to consider. Satan charged God and questioned God's justice. Satan charged that Job was righteous because of what God gave him. Satan attacked Job's integrity, taking away all he had. He attacked Job's integrity by destroying his health, attacked Job's integrity through his friends and through his friends' misunderstanding of who God was. Job's friends engage in character assassination of not only God, but of Job. It was 1980. I was 17 years old at Upper Columbia Academy in Spokane, and I was outside sitting with some of the other uh, classmates, a dark cloud darkened the sky and it just moved over the sky and threw a cloak over the sun. We looked at the sky and we thought the world was ending. We thought Jesus is coming. We're not going to be able to get married. We're not going to be able to do this and that. It was Mount St. Helens that blew up in May 18, 1980. And everything was covered with ash. And the world stopped. We all got to go home, though, early. But the world stopped. By permission of God, the test came. Everything in Job's life was touched. The sun became darkness. And blackness came into his soul. Jesus said, The Satan, our enemy, comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Let's count the losses. If you look at Job, one, and it's, you notice that all these losses, as soon as Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, all these losses just came in bunches. And there was always just one person that brought the, the good news, right? No, the bad news. So verse 15, the Sabians raided and took um, the servants and took the oxen and the donkey, the donkeys. And then there was the Chaldeans that came. And then there was fire of God in verse 16 that fell. Was it God's fire? No. It was Satan who did it and always blames God for anything wrong that happens in this world. And then the worst part. You see, Job had ten children. A great wind came from the wilderness and struck the corners of the house and all his children were killed. 
So the question is, how would Job respond to losing everything except his wife, to losing his health except he had nothing? He had ten children, they were gone. All his property was gone. Let's look at the response of Job. Would he succumb to evil or hang on to God? Job 1.20 says, Job arose, tore his robes, shaved his head. Some of us have such beautiful heads that we don't need hair. Um, shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshipped. When was the last time you had a bad day and you came home and you said, I want to worship God today because I had such a bad day. Not only was it a bad day, he lost everything. And he fell down and worshiped. And what did he say? Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Bless be the name of the Lord. What a testimony. The second response after losing his health is found in 2.10. And because I'm only going to, go to read part of the verse because I go home with my wife and I have respect for all the ladies here and respect for my wife and I will not read the response he had to his wife. But it says here, shall we not accept adversity? Shall we not accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And in verse 22 it says, he did not charge God with wrong. Job was right of no, not charging God with wrong because it was Satan that had done it. Behind the curtain, we see the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Integrity was tested. Integrity was under attack. Suffering with no answers. Suffering yet trusting God and all of it. Suffering with his friends that would tell him it was his fault. Suffering that came because his friends said he had sinned against God. Let's continue to look at the grandeur, the magnificence, the awesomeness of this human experience. And I'm going to read just a few tidbits that I found just too awesome not to share. In, in Job 3, a lament of three whys. Why did I not die at birth? Why is life given to him who is in misery and life to the bitter in soul? Why is life given to a man who is hidden, whom God has hedged in? Have you ever felt hedged in? Hedged in by life? By loss? By illness, I remember being hedged in. I remember the cancer diagnosis. I remember the suffering. And I remember the recovery. And I remembered the goodness of God. And it says here in Job 6, tragedy expressed. Job expresses his tragedy. He says, oh, that my calamity was weighed in the balance. It would be heavier than the sand of the sea. And Job 6 the request of a deeply wounded man struggling with depression, PTSD, and loss. Oh, that I might have my request that God would fulfill my hope, that it would please God to crush me, that he would cut me off. This would be my comfort. But Job continues to hang on to his integrity. I have not denied, I have not denied the words of the Holy One. Speaking of physical suffering, hopelessness and despair job 7 says has not a man a hard service on the earth are not his days like the days of a hired hand like a slave who longs for the shadow like a hired hand who looks for his wages so i am allotted months of emptiness and nights of misery are appointed to me and this is the experiences we sometimes have when we're suffering when i lay down i say when shall i get up but the night is long, and I am full of tossing till the dawn. My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens, then breaks afresh. My days are swift, and they end without hope. 
Remember that my life is a breath. My eyes will never again see good. Then there's Job's emotional pain and the fog of suffering. My face is red with weeping. On my eyelids there's deep dark, darkness. Although there's no violence in my hands and my prayer is pure. Man is born of a woman a few days and full of trouble. He comes, he, he is like a flower and then he withers. He flees like a shadow and continues not. And do not I open the eyes of the one who brings to judgment? Who can bring a clean thing out of unclean? Since his days are determined in the number of his months, you have pointed a limit. Look away from him and leave him alone that he may enjoy like a hired hand his day. Job did not fully understand why he lost everything. And Job 12 says, Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? You see, Satan was the instigator. Satan was the cause of all of Job's suffering. There's a shepherd story that doesn't have a name. It says, A rattler bit my sheep on the face a week ago. The deadliest snake around... The sheep's face swallowed up and it hurt like crazy. The old rattler did not know the type of blood that runs in the sheep. You see, the antidote is usually made up of sheep's blood. The sheep was swollen for about two days. But you see, the blood of the lamb destroyed the serpent's venom. I worried that the sheep didn't I worried but the sheep didn't care it continued to drink it continued to eat Brothers and sisters here's the point of that story don't worry about the serpent and its bite just be sure that the lamb's blood flows through your veins We cannot separate Job's suffering from Christ God and Christ in the flesh grappled and suffered with humanity at the cross and throughout all time. Job 16, 17, and 19 also speak of the suffering of Christ. It says here, God has worn me out. He has torn me in His wrath. The wrath of God for sin on the cross. God gives me up to the ungodly and casts me into the hands of the wicked. They have struck me and my spirit is broken. They have spit upon me. You see, through the darkness, Job trusted in God. And let's read about the faith of Job. Job 13. Job 13, 15, and 16. Though he slay me, Yet I will trust in him, even so I will defend my way. He shall be my salvation. Brothers and sisters, I don't care what you're facing. He can be your salvation. He can be your confidence. Job 19 speaks also of the faith and integrity of Job. Job 19, 23 to 27. Oh, that my words were written in a book. Job, they were written in a book. We're reading about them today. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book and they were engraved on the rocks with an iron pen and, lead, and led forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. Do your heart, does your heart yearn for the coming of Jesus? I know we are celebrating the fact that he conquered death. Uh, many other denominations are in regard to the, the, the rising of Christ from dead from the dead but he is the author of life and he wants to give us life today 
Leo Caesar speaks of the suffering. The suffering of Job was a brutal reality where Satan seeks to prove God wrong by launching vicious attacks against an innocent man. Yet Job humbly submits to God, acknowledges the supremacy of God. The book is a theodicy, a philosophical argument that vindicates the justice and goodness of God in spite of the presence of evil. You see, divine integrity is found in Job. Let me say that again. Divine integrity is found in Job. Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Who is the most powerful? Job is the most powerful representation of this virtue, divine integrity. Not because Job was sinless. He repented in the end. Job was, as the Hebrew word says, tamam which it means just, honest, perfect, and peaceful. Job was tom, committed exclusively to godliness and God-likeness. Tam means also a pure and simple commitment to God. Job experienced nearly parallels what Jesus went through, the chasm of eternal separation that he tasted death for every man for you and for me Jesus cried out on the cross my God my God why has thou forsaken me Job means persecuted and hated Jesus was persecuted and hated as well why is Job's story so important the article ends by saying, through the mystifying combination of false opinions, of convincing yet distorted pictures of God, combined with fervent action in his name, will produce a time of trouble that has never been. Again, the answering of integrity. will hear again the taunts of Job's friends. God will look for people who will exhibit what? They will exhibit His power and His grace to the whole onlooking universe. God will look for people with a pure and simple commitment to God. At the end of the book, God speaks. And, uh, and Job 38 Job 38. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Verse 1. Who is this who darkens my counsel by words without knowledge? And then God speaks again in Job 40. Verse 1. The Lord said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him who rebuke? He who rebukes God, let him answer. So what happens is God answers Job, but he takes him on a tour of creation. That's the answer that Job got. Takes him a tour of God's creation. And then Job answers God in verse and chapter 40. Verses 3 to 5. Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. And then he answers God a second time. You see, before that, um, he, said, he was saying, I look for you, but I can't find you. I don't see where you are. We physically cannot see God, but we see the goodness and grace of God. But here he answers in Job, in Job 42. Job answers God. I know that you can do everything, and that no person, purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who, who hides counsel or speaks without knowledge? I have uttered what I did not understand. I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you. Now here's Job saying, now I have seen you, God. 
verses 5 and 6. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, and now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I repent in dust and ashes. George Mueller was transformed by God. A thief who betrayed his friends put uh, God changed him and he raised a hundred and eighty million dollars through what through prayer and faith in Jesus he founded a hundred and seventeen schools educated a hundred and twenty thousand orphans as a director at Bristol England's Ashley Downs orphanage he cared for 10,024 orphans based on one simple promise of God. Psalms 68.5 says, God is a father to the orphan. Mueller wrote about his conversion. When I surrendered myself to God, the love of money was gone. The love of home was gone. The effect of wealth was gone. The love of the world was gone. God became my everything and I found in him that there's nothing else I wanted. I stayed with him a happy man, a very happy man, seeking only to accomplish the things of God. Mueller's message echoes today. God is real. He is a God in whom you and I can trust. He's sufficient. It is sufficient to trust God. Mueller said something that I like to repeat as much as I can when I remember to repeat. You know, as you get older, you don't remember things as much. But this is something that I like to memorize and repeat often. It says here, don't worry about earthly things. For the beginning of worry is the end of faith. The beginning of faith is the end of worry. Joel, it is said that George Mueller read his Bible 200 times, many times on his knees. Before his death, a reporter asked him what he would like to do. And he said, to read more of the Bible because I know too little about the excellency of Christ. Don't worry about the serpent's bite. Just be sure that the lamb's blood flows through your veins. God is inviting us to live a life of integrity, a pure godly, to search out and seek pure godliness and godlikeness in Christ Jesus. A pure and simple commitment to God. And may I leave you with one final thought. You can trust God, come what may. see Janet coming up I said oh no <laughs> there she is <laughs> um, please open your hymnal to 529 under his wings Yeah. 
our Heavenly Father. We thank you that in this world of suffering, we can trust you. We thank you that you are calling us to integrity in Jesus. And we ask that we may be a light to the world to point everyone to Jesus, our all-sufficient Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.